Good day, everyone, and welcome to Expand a Child's World. This is the 12th of 18 programs in the SSU's Dig Into Nature Fall 2021 series. My name is Margot Rollins, and I'm a program coordinator with the Center for Environmental Inquiry, and I will be your host today. Our public events are usually done at our preserves, but they've gone virtual since the start of the pandemic. We're slowly easing back into a hybrid model with our fall events still virtual, but looking at bringing more hikes and training sessions in the spring on, on site. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are. The Center for Environmental Inquiry is here to empower students of all ages and disciplines to solve the environmental challenges of the North Bay. In other words, to turn education into action. We provide direct outdoor experiences on our three preserves, Fairfield Osborne on Sonoma Mountain in Ronert Park, the Galbraith Wildlands Preserve in Southern Mendocino County and Los Gilicos in Kenwood. We provide classes, workshops, and tours that focus on experiential learning and skill building. Additionally, we make the preserves available to anyone who has an interest in research, education, or creative inquiry. Another thing that we do is we invest in real world projects, working with faculty, community, and students across all disciplines again, to develop projects focused on finding solutions to these environmental challenges of the North Bay. And finally, we create long-term multi-institutional partnerships that generate the resources and funding needed to chip away at complex issues such as water, fire, technology, and other topics. We invite you to join our diverse community of learners and problem solvers, no matter what your background or connection to the university, because all sectors of society and all parts of the community need to get involved if we're going to be successful in addressing these issues. There are many ways that you can get involved. You can engage in research, take our naturalist or land management training programs, learn about the virtual field collaboration for undergraduate classes, and be involved in internships or student jobs, access data, lead events like these, partner with us on projects, or help create more programs like this by donating since they are funded completely by the generous support of donors. And do come to our Saturday hikes on the Osborne Preserve. We plan to return to walks on the Galbraith in the spring. Our presenter today is Suzanne DeCourse. Suzanne is the education lead at the Center for Environmental Inquiry. And she, with, along with you, are going to focus on bringing the wonders of the outside world of nature to children. In 2005, Richard Louvre wrote a book entitled Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. This book helped focus people on the critical role the environment plays in the development and health of our children, as well as in the future of the world. Suzanne will lead us as we think about each of our own roles in expanding a child's world, and she will so show us some very effective ways to do just that. Suzanne has asked, she's going to be asking you some questions, uh, all of us together, and she's asked that you put your answers in the chat and I will relay them to her. After the event, if you have any questions and need some follow-up, please get in touch with me at Rollins, R-A-W-L-I-N-S-M, at Sonoma.edu. With that, it's over to you, Suzanne. Margo is going to, uh, at various points, ask questions where we're going to ask people to raise their hands. So uh, she needs to then see your hand as you raise it. But as she mentioned, my name is Suzanne DeCourcy, and I'm the Education Manager for SSU's Center for Environmental Inquiry. And let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And Margo, I'm going to ask you to tell me what you see so I can make sure everyone sees what I'm seeing on my screen. Sorry, I see um, 
I guess you're opening slide, expand the child's world. Perfect. And it fills your screen? Yeah, if I move everybody off to the side properly. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, fantastic. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm always excited to talk about the ways that SSU's Center for Environmental Inquiry can, can help uh, expand people's worlds and, and uh, specifically children's worlds. Uh, I was actually very excited to come here to the center. My, uh, you know, I originally started out in the National Park Service uh, and then worked for the Nature Conservancy before going back to graduate school. And I was very excited to come to the center and get a chance to work with university students and also uh, third through fifth graders. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as Margot mentioned, the center itself has three preserves and these are a part of the campus. So there is much a part of campus as the library or a computer lab. Uh, but when you add all that land together, it's over 4,000 acres. So there are these amazing resources that are part of SSU. Uh, and we're going to at one point go on a virtual walk at SSU's Fairfield Osborne Preserve, which is the closest to SSU's main campus, which is this green dot. And those are uh, lands of the Native Americans now represented by the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. So it is a very special place. And I know a lot of you are already uh, pretty familiar with it. Uh, but um, as Margot mentioned, the center basically exists because we believe that everyone, uh, no matter their age, no matter their discipline, uh, needs to be environmentally ready. So prepared and engaged in finding innovative solutions to environmental challenges. And how exactly does that fit into expanding a child's world? Well, as Margot mentioned, Richard Louvre uh, coined the term nature deficit disorder as an environmental challenge. Uh, and he, he wanted to point out, you know, it sounds like being outside is, oh, it's a leisurely activity or, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a optional activity, I guess would be a better way to say it. Uh, but he wanted to point out it's not leisure time, it's an essential investment in our children's health. And not just our children's health, but um, uh, the, or rather individual children's health, you can see that if you are deprived with time in nature, uh, there it's correlated with all kinds of challenges, uh, psychological, physical, and even social. And uh, it's not just having to do with an individual's health, but also the health of the planet. Because as you can imagine, if you're keeping people out of the outdoors and keeping children out of the outdoors, uh, there's going to be a dis disengagement. And Richard Louv used the term alienation, an alienation there. And we're all going to have to come together and, and work on these environmental challenges. And if part of the society has, has not had experiences outside and it does not seem particularly relevant to them, then we'll have a hard time addressing these challenges. And there are, there's actually quite a body of literature on the connection between children's health and environmental experiences. This is, in, and there's a lot more than this. This is just, these are just a few, uh, but uh, there's, there's a quite a body of literature uh, that talks about how connected um, th th these outside experiences are to uh, children's health, learning, and uh, social uh, experiences. And we know that it has gotten even more challenging post-COVID. So that disconnection has, in many cases, accelerated. So there have definitely been fewer in-person opportunities. And I don't want to say, oh, that you know, everything has been terrible because there have been definitely some positive challenges. There's been some, there have been some great uh, leaps forward in terms of access, in terms of technological uh, experiences that, that you can bring parts of the world that you would otherwise not at all get a chance to visit to people. And in fact, the virtual field is doing that. But 
uh, there have been fewer in-person opportunities. And so it will be interesting to see how that plays out in the future in terms of uh, children's health and learning. And I, I wanna take a pause here to mention that I'm using the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of making a distinction between humans and nature. And that's because English kind of just makes that distinction for us. And that's the language that I'm using right now. Uh, but of course, we're not separate from nature. We're not outside of nature. Uh, and so just bear that in mind when I'm talking about this, that it's not, there isn't that bright line, you know, we're part of nature. And in fact, we, we evolved in what we call nature, uh, the outdoors. Uh, and uh, lived, you know, for the vast majority of the time that we've been human in environments that are quite different from the environments that some of us live in today. So just bear that in mind when we're talking about this, uh, that there is no, that there's not a, a, you know, real bright line distinction, but that's kind of the language that I've got to use since I'm an English speaker. And because of that, it makes complete sense that, you know, we just saw how if children are deprived of time in the outdoors, then that's correlated with some, you know, big challenges. Conversely, if children are able to spend time in the outdoors, we actually see some really interesting things. So we see that learning outcomes tend to improve. We see mental and physical health parameters improve. And we also see uh, better social and emotional development. So by getting kids outside, then you really do see fewer of the things that you associate with nature deficit disorder. And even though nature deficit disorder is not a, an actual medical diagnosis, you wouldn't go to a doctor and hear, well, you have nature deficit disorder. Uh, it is correlated with all of these other outcomes that we see. And we know that people just generally feel and learn and interact better when they have the opportunity to get outside. So I think when we talk about learning, a lot of people, this is what we visualize. So if someone said visualize learning or teaching, uh, this, is, this is what comes to a lot of our minds. It certainly comes to my mind. But I'm going to ask a question that's going to seem kind of strange. Uh, so this is uh, why I asked if, if folks could turn on their cameras so that Margot can see you raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you remember all the answers to one of your um, fourth grade history tests. Raise your hand if you remember all the answers to a fourth grade history test. There are no hands. <laughs> and, and I don't think you can't see this. I don't think Suzanne, but Natalie is off camera because she's chasing her two-year-old around. Oh, speaking yeah. of kids. Um, so Natalie- if, if I've, I've asked her just to chat her answers to your questions to me and I'll uh, add her into the mix. Perfect. Um, the, no problem, Natalie. And you can also, you can either chat or I think there's a way to raise a digital hand too, if you, if you would rather do that. Um, so that seems like a completely nonsensical question people think there's absolutely no way that I'm going to remember the answers to my fourth grade history test. But I'm going to ask another question now. If you had a good friend or a best friend in elementary school, do you remember the name of, do you remember the name of that person? Do you remember the name of your good or best friend in elementary school? And raise your hand or, or put in the chat if you do. Well, most of us have a hand up. Uh huh. And I don't know. Oh, if Natalie, we all have hands up. Natalie says yes too. Okay, great. And I don't know if you can see me. My I have my hand up too. Your hands up too. Um. So again, that seems like a nonsensical question. Well, of course, I'm going to remember my friend's name. But to us, but those are both kinds of learning. And one of them we remember very easily. 
and one of them we basically don't remember at all. And that's because uh, we know that there's quite a bit of research that shows that uh, emotion underlies effective learning. So if, if there is a, an emotional connection to something, you tend to remember it more. And in other words, there isn't a necessarily a direct transmission of knowledge between teacher and student. I, again, I think a lot of us, if we look at the picture on the left, this is kind of how we imagine as, as someone who has uh, shared you know, a lot of information with people, I, th I think, you know, the, the picture on the left, that's what I imagine. Oh, I'm going to transmit knowledge directly. Uh, but again, we know from quite a bit of research, not just uh, in humans, but also on other primates, that learning often looks a lot more like the picture on the right. So there's, you know, you see a monkey, you know, doing something with an object and then in the background you see another monkey and that other monkey definitely looks interested there's so what's going on there so again that that emotional connection to the learning that tends to stick with you and of course that's because humans don't learn things because we are you know in in, in our uh, species history where we're, we're uh, supposed to be learning uh, test answers, it's because it's adaptive for us. So we learn because it's a tool for survival. And so we tend to learn those things very strongly that have those emotional connections. And we tend to learn things very strongly that when we observe, when we observe other people reacting to them or doing them. Uh, and one of the most interesting pieces of research that, that's come out of this field of study is that we do know that people learn how learn phobias. We know that people aren't born with, there are very few fears that children seem to be born with, but there are a number of fears that you can then develop. And so by watching someone be afraid of a snake, a, a child might learn to be afraid of snakes. But the great news is, is that it can also inoculate against phobias. So if you watch someone not be afraid of snakes and are, are very interested in snakes, then that seems to be what children learn. So then even if they see other people being afraid of snakes, they, that first learning is what sticks with them. And so a lot of, of what we can do in nature is simply to model an approach to the natural world. And we know that, that observational learning, again, is a really powerful uh, way that children learn. Uh, so just essentially observing or listening to adults even talk or among themselves or interact with each other, uh, and also uh, having children interact directly with adults and other students um, can help really cement that learning. So just being outside and modeling a, an approach to the natural world that is curious and is um, respectful and, and, you know, shows it as something that is not alarming or scary. And I will say that whoever uh, at the end of the presentation, when we ha have time for questions and answers, uh, you get a gold star if you know why on this slide there's a picture of an African gray parrot. So if you think you know, ponder that and we can talk about it at the end. So we're going to, we're going to uh, do a little bit of an experiment on ourselves. So we're going to take a virtual walk and we're going to put ourselves in the position of a child. So one of our naturalists who leads tours at the Osborne Preserve, I love his approach. He will say, everybody is a kid. And all the adults, everybody in the group is a child. And he'll, he'll usually say, 
uh, you know, he'll ask how old people are. He, he says he's seven. So we all approach with the same sense of adventure and, and using our senses, because that's where you can really have those direct experiences and where observational learning can really, really take hold. So we're going to do that ourselves. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to visit the Fairfield Osborne Preserve, which just to remind you is right here. Uh, so it's very close to the main SSU campus. In fact, it's only six miles away. It's on top of Sonoma Mountain. And if we zoom in even more, we can see that here's the main SSU campus. Here is the Fairfield Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain. And this blue line is Copeland Creek. Whoops, sorry about that. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, and we are heading to the beginning of Copeland Creek, the headwaters where it starts. And one of the things that we want to do as we go on this virtual walk is I'd like to ask people to make observations. So an observation is something that you notice using your senses. So when we ask you to make an observation or ask, what do you notice? Um, then that's essentially what we're asking you to do in this, uh, on this virtual walk. So in this picture, what do you notice? How do you want us? How do you want us to answer? Do you want people to just keep the thoughts to themselves, or everybody? Well, actually, Margo, I'm going to ask you to to now uh, answer verbally. Okay. Well, it's a maple leaf. Oh, interesting. So, so Margo, I'm I'm sorry. You made an identification. You did not make an observation. Uh, so, what do you notice? Yeah. It, I don't know, it looks kind of slimy. Hmm. So uh, that is, it might be slimy, but that's actually not something that you can see. So what do you notice using your eyes? Well, it's yellow and the edges are sort of pointy. Great. So excellent. That was a good observation. So Margot made an observation using just what she noticed in this picture. So not identifications, using previous knowledge, just what she could see right here. We're also going to uh, have you ask questions by asking, what do you wonder? Uh, I wonder why it's yellow. Great, thank you, Margo. Thank you for, no, uh, for modeling, um, noticing and wondering. So basically that's what we'd like all our participants to do, just like Margo did, except in the chat box, because as I mentioned, we'll be playing a video. Uh, so we want you to be able to notice and wonder uh, while the video is playing. So uh, focus on what you can notice using your eyes and your ears and also what do you wonder and one thing that i have discovered about adults is there's a there can be a lot of what questions what is that i wonder what that is um, and it can be a bit more fruitful if you focus on how and why questions so margo asked why is the leaf yellow and that first of all has more interesting answers and more opportunities for interaction. Because if someone asks what something is, then you just say the answer and that's, that's the end of it. Uh, so how and why questions can be more interesting. So we're going to go on our virtual walk and just kind of continually type in the, um, in the chat box. You don't have to just like notice or wonder one thing and then stop. Just keep going like because the camera is going to be moving and you might notice different things and come up with different questions as we go through our walk. And the other thing and I want to- oh. For just a second. Yes. Because we're a really small group and I, I think this is going to be hard. I mean, mm. Natalie's put some things she wonders in the chat, but I'm wondering if everybody's okay or if you're okay, Natalie, with turning on your audio and yes, so your two-year-old will be talking, um, but then you can participate a little more fully. Is that okay with 
everybody knows an okay answer to. So, are you okay with that, Natalie? Okay, maybe not. She's running around. Ah, uh, okay. Go, go ahead, go ahead, then, Suzanne. Was, no, no problem. So what? Yes, she is, she, maybe she can't turn her audio on. I don't know. She's going to try. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, um, I do also want to mention, and as Margot said, this is a small group, so we may be able to, to get through all of these, but especially if you're coming up with tons of things that you notice and tons of questions, we may not get to all of them uh, during this presentation, uh, but I will compile all of these because I bet there's going to be some great observations uh, and questions. I will compile all of them and send them back out to this group so everyone can, can see what other people have been noticing. And also I will get to, we'll get to some questions at the end, but we may not be able to get to all of them. I will answer all of the questions just again uh, via, uh, via email. Uh, so, so don't worry if we don't share your excellent observation or we don't get to all of your questions, uh, we will be able to uh, respond to that later in the email. So, all right, everyone, get ready to notice and wonder, and we will start our walk.
Okay, so Margot, I'm wondering if you can share some of the observations that people made in the chat box. I will do that. Um, okay, I noticed green fluffy stuff on a rock. Fantastic. Excellent uh, noticing. I noticed running water and fallen branches. Wonderful. Um, I was wondering, noticing, noticing, wondering, wondering. Uh, there is a new type type of leaf that appears. Mm, mm hmm. Yes. I notice a white foam on the water. So these these are all wonderful observations, and my apologies to to not get to all of them because I know that you know there will be some, there's some great noticing going on here. But like I said, we'll compile all of these and send them out to the group. And now I'm wondering, or <laughs> did not do that on purpose, but Margot, could you share some of the questions that people were also asking? I wonder what time of year this is. Ooh, boy, that's an excellent question. And I can tell you that this is, act I actually uh, took this footage just after our last, uh, well, our, our only so far atmospheric river that took place a couple weeks ago. And I mentioned that one of the ways we can use videos, because obviously we can go outside and do this ourselves locally, which is absolutely, we, we should all be doing that. And you can use more senses then. You can use touch and smell and even taste. Um, but uh, this, what we just saw here, even though it's on the Osborne Preserve, which is nearby, this is a very unusual site because this particular cascade only flows after a big rainstorm. So this was just taken a couple weeks ago after the atmospheric river. So it was in the autumn or the beginning of our wet season, depending on how you want to, to uh, describe it. Um, I wonder what kind of animals live there. Ooh, excellent. And that's such a fruitful avenue of discussion with kids, <laughs> especially if then you can see uh, you know, how would we find that out? Maybe you can find animals, maybe you can find evidence of animals. So that's a wonderful, wonderful question. I wonder if there are any amphibians walking around because it looks pretty moist. Ah, so that's, that's great. So that's a combination of a question and an observation. So it looks moist, Therefore, I wonder if there are moisture loving animals, in, in this case, amphibians here. So those were great questions. And like I said, we'll compile all of these and I will answer uh, the questions to the best of my ability, uh, in addition to sharing all the great observations that people have made. So thank you very much for uh, going on the virtual walk and noticing and wondering. And what we saw here is, is sometimes called flipping the script, because if you are like me, I love to tell people things. Oh, this is what that is. Here's some interesting facts about that. And that actually is um, fairly important. There's actually some new research that shows that content is actually something that you want to be sharing with children and, and people in general. But it's helpful to kind of do it the other way from the way a lot of us often like, you know, a lot of, a lot of us often like to do it because I like to tell people first, but if uh, you give them the opportunity to discover first, so have those open-ended experiences and then share the information, it's also really wonderful because then children or students are leading the exploration. Uh, so in as much as you know, you can grant freedom to let's, you know, what are you most interested in, uh, then uh, you have that opportunity for that, that more exploratory approach. Uh, and finally, we were, um, you know, we had a chance to be quiet. I was very 
interested and surprised to hear from kids when they come up to the Osborne Preserve, uh, because we focus on third through fifth grade field trips for local school children. And sometimes you would ask, okay, what's, what's, what was the thing you were, that you were most interested in? And so many of them would say, be, being able to essentially be quiet. And many of them, especially now, are saying, we don't get to do that. You never get to do that. Uh, you know, where you're not focusing on your phone or, uh, you know, having some other kind of interaction where you're not just able to be in a place. And so that this is a wonderful opportunity to have that learning happen, but at the same time, you're not constantly, you know, talking to people. Uh, and finally, it's hard to go wrong with questions. So I asked you two questions at once. I asked you, what do you notice and what do you wonder? Because you're adults and can handle it. With kids, it's often helpful to do one at a time. So we will focus first on noticing and then on wondering. Um, I have a question that's come up, yes. however. Okay. Thank you, Margo. And it's kind of, it's kind of both. Uh, what activity, Ned wants to know, are the students in the photo doing? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I so, what doing. so they are actually looking, so they're, they're first going through an observation exercise to find what invertebrates are in the, that, that's water that they took out of a pond on the Osborne Preserve. And they're first making observations about the uh, invertebrates. So the little creepy crawlies that live in the pond. And you actually can't see because he's out of the frame, but they have with them a, um, uh, an entomology faculty member from SSU who is then sharing information about the different invertebrates that they're finding, not only what they are, but also what that says about the health of the water. So that's the great thing about these invertebrates is if you find certain ones, you can you know, make a, a, an educated, um, well, not even a guess, but you can, you can uh, hypothesize that the water is either you know, has a lot of unhealthy nutrients in it, or that it actually is, is quite clean. And so I actually know, because I was there, <laughs> that um, the students are, they ended up deciding that the water was in, in quite good shape. And of course, that's something that uh, you can actually do that fairly easily, even if you don't have specific knowledge about that, because there's, there are quite a few um, resources online, either keys that say, you know, the, this is what you find if, if it is, if water is more polluted, and this is what you find if it's less polluted. And nowadays, of course, apps can, can do something similar. Um, and so with really young kids, you might focus a lot more on the noticing and wondering once you get to, and in my experience, and actually Margot, Margo has experienced this herself, uh, with some programs that we've run up in Anderson Valley. Um, but once you get to around, you know, kind of older elementary school and middle school, uh, you know, you can really bring in the, the um, uh, connection between what you're finding in the water and what that says about the health of the water. So I hope you all felt curious when you were watching that video. Uh, you, I, I, whenever I watch things like that, I, want to, I always want to know what's going to happen next, you know. And curiosity is one of those things that just like you might even think about or one might even think about nature in general, seems kind of like, oh, that's all, you know, curiosity is, is all right, but it's not as important as, you know, having really good math ability or you know, really good reading ability. But there really is, again, in, in a lot of research is starting to show how important curiosity is and how easily curiosity is fostered by bringing kids outdoors. So if none of you have taken an inattentional blindness test, you can usually find them online and you're given some kind of a task, count this, you know, do this. And then there's something else that happens in the frame, and it is shocking how many people miss a very obvious thing. So in other words, when you have a directed task, 
it interferes with your ability to generally notice things. And that's not to say directed tasks are, are bad. We do, that all, we do that all the time with, like I said, identifying um, the invertebrates and maybe trying to figure out if they're connected to or how they're connected to uh, water uh, pollution levels. But do that later, because if you do it first, you interfere with people's ability to just kind of generally notice. And sometimes people, when people notice things, it's actually more interesting or more relevant than what you were going to talk about to begin with. I have another question for you. Yes. From the audience. How do we best find a balance in following up with content after the I notice and I wonder activities with, with kids in correcting their answers that students share that are totally wrong? So I usually don't. Um, immediate, uh, I, the follow-up is like a day late, like a day later. <laughs> like, I mean, it, in, in, in the moment, um, you know, uh, it, I'll usually respond if something is, if something is dang a dangerous misconception, like, you know, I can eat poison oak. Obviously that's something you have to correct, you know, correct at the moment. But if it's not, I'll usually just say that's a very, like, that's really interesting. Um, and just kind of really help encourage the curiosity first. And then much, much later, like at the end of the day, just maybe have a sentence or two that really goes back to that. But it's, it's not directly that, that you're not directly calling out that child and being like, oh, you were wrong about that. And actually there's a, there's a, um, there's a um, faculty member in the Hutchins School, which is the liberal arts school of SSU. And she would always ask her students because her idea, and actually there, there is some, some evidence behind that, that kids are, are almost, one might say, natural scientists, you know, very much interested in kind of looking and investigating and observing. And she would ask her liberal arts class, she'd say, tell me the time at school that you learned to hate science. And she said almost every one of her students had a story of, you know, thinking I'm not smart enough. I, you know, like I did this thing and I thought it was cool, but it turned out to be wrong. So I would just tread really, really lightly there because when, especially when you're outside, that's the opportunity to have the curiosity and the observation. One great thing about observations is it's really hard to have them be wrong unless they're not observations. And that's part of the reason why Margot and I did the modeling is I never model that with kids. I never say, Tommy, you know, tell me an observation. And then, you know, if he said that's a maple leaf, well, that that's wrong. I did it with another adult uh, because then there's an observational learning opportunity there, uh, but it's not focused on, on any particular kids. They can see Mar Margo, boy, Margo's a dummy. Sorry, Margo, you're not a dummy. But you know, it, the idea is, is they're learning from an interaction between two adults, which is not gonna be focusing on them. And there's plenty of opportunities to kind of, you know, correct the knowledge in environments that aren't as exciting as the outdoors. So I will say part of that is also just, just my own feelings about things. And I'm always excited to hear what other people, how other people have experienced these things too. So, so Suzanne, would you do this modeling exercise in, in front of children if you had another? Yes. Would. Yeah, and in fact, we did. So I part of why, how this came up exactly the way that it did is we of course, last academic year, just like everyone else, we weren't able to have, you know, uh, third through fifth grade field trips on the SSU preserves because kids weren't in doing in-person school. And so everything became virtual. So I, what I realized is, is we would do something kind of like this, but it wasn't as deliberate, but I was trying to think how, how in the world can we, um, 
you know, how in the world can we kind of get get at that a little bit? And that's, I actually came up with the, the idea of essentially this script with another adult. And it worked so well that we've started to essentially um, implement it in the field trips too. Uh, so obviously you do need, if you're going to do this, you do need another adult. Like you're, you know, you do need someone that you can interact with that way. Um, but, uh, but that's kind of how it, it came into being. And it, it seems to work really, it seems to work really well um, because it's observational learning. It's not, it's not directing any kind of, you know, you're wrong at any particular kid. It's just an interaction between two adults that can demonstrate what we're trying to go for. So Wait, are you going to explain this slide a little bit? <laughs> I was going to Margo, and then you kept asking questions. Um, so no, that's good. That's excellent. Thank you for demonstrating uh, curiosity. And it's funny that you're talking about the power of curiosity uh, because I just mentioned to get, or I just mentioned during the last slide that we think of it as, as kind of being an add on or, or yeah, that's great if someone's curious, but it's not really that helpful in, in their career. And there's actually been again, research that shows that curiosity itself is a form of giftedness. So even if someone isn't testing as gifted in reading or math or any like particular um, uh, discipline, if they're curious, they tend to do better in their career and in their life. And there's been longitudinal studies that have actually followed this. And the effect is stronger in uh, children who are less advantaged. So this really, this is really a way to help people succeed in life. It's, it's not kind of one of these like frou-frou add-ons. And the reason that, the, that there's this picture in the slide is this is actually uh, a demonstration of um, polarization. And we also know that people who are curious tend to be more open to new ideas and have greater comfort with ambiguity and generally be less polarized, which is, I would argue, a good thing, you know, based on where kind of we're going in society. Um, and just like curiosity, uh, there are other one might call soft skills uh, that can really be uh, that really come out when children are exposed to outdoor environments. Um, attention. Uh, we, we know that attention spans are getting shorter uh, and um, well, just all kinds of discussions we can have about that. But we also know that that going outside actually can be an attention restoration activity. Um, and it gives it gives people uh, not just children, but but everybody, the opportunity to reflect, uh, which again seems like one of those frou frou add-ons. But we know that reflection is very uh, closely connected to memory and also to flashes of insight and inspiration. So, in other words, uh, there've been there've been experiments that have brought people, you know, had people, you know, do some do an exercise that that demonstrates creativity, and then they bring them outside, and people get more creative because. Um, the, the just being outside has, has an effect on um, how the brain is kind of going into its, its uh, default, default mode in which those flashes of insight can happen. And you've probably experienced your, it yourself. If you've been sitting in front of your computer and you cannot, you're trying to deal with something, you cannot, it's, oh my God, my, my, I'm blocked. And you go out for a walk and then all of a sudden it comes to you. All right you you've got it so all of these things sometimes called soft skills are actually uh seem to be getting more and more valued in workplaces simply because content is so quickly out of date you know technology zips along and even things in the natural sciences there are things that i just knew about in theory as a graduate student that undergraduates are now doing as a matter of course in their classes so if i were depending just on my content knowledge i'd be you know i'd be out of luck but those soft skills that creativity the ability to to innovate work with others uh, and communicate. Those are those skills that are really transferable and one could argue timeless. And we know, speaking of, you know, the ability to communicate, collaborate and lead, that 
that those outdoor experiences are also helpful for social and emotional development. And I know we're kind of getting, we're getting a, a little short on time, so I'll, I'll kind of zip through the, these last slides with the idea that, uh, you know, we, there, there will be plenty of time to ask questions about this. But generally speaking, um, uh, having outdoor experiences help people uh, have less black and white thinking and, and, as I mentioned before, be more comfortable with ambiguity and also generally be more satisfied in life uh, and also be more pro-social. So there have been re some really interesting studies that show that, that being outside and being able to kind of relax and, and expand band boundaries tends to, uh, you, you see more pro-social behavior from children and even adults than you, do, than you see in other environments. And of course, it's just great for your health. So um, I won't go through all of the all of these uh, points and, and uh, pieces of research, but just know it's really good for your mental health to get outside. Um, even things like exercise, which are already good for your mental health, seem to be even better if you're doing them outside. And there's also an antidepressant soil bacterium found in many of the soils of the world. So I like to think of that when I am breathing that good earth smell. Uh, and finally, of course, it's, it's wonderful for physical health. And again, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just to pull out a couple that are per of particular interest nowadays, definitely uh, there, there's evidence that you see improved immune function when people spend time outside, which in the time of COVID is definitely a good reason to spend time outside. And it may seem strange to have a slide about brain health in a um, presentation about children uh, because all of these diseases listed here are, are often called diseases of aging, so Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, and cognitive decline in general. But we also know that the, the stage is sometimes set for many of these diseases, you know, a lot earlier in life. And in general, spending time outside seems to, uh, seems to um, improve or, or make uh, these diseases of aging less prevalent. So just to return a full circle back to the beginning, um, uh, we're concerned at the center about all of this because we want environmental, environmental readiness for all and nature deficit disorder definitely interferes with that, which is uh, why we're, we're very concerned about the environmental challenges that we uh, are experiencing right now, uh, because we're all going to have to work together to address these and to turn education into action. So um, there's a lot of different ways that, that you can join us to turn in, in education into action. And I won't go through all of these uh, because there's lots of different ways to do it, but I do want to mention that we are starting a new naturalist ed series. So if this was something that you heard about, you know, you, you went through this presentation, you thought, wow, this is great. I would really like to try to address nature deficit disorder. Then please join us uh, in our new naturalist ed series. You'll get a chance to spend time at the Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain learn from, fac from university faculty and other experts, uh, and also uh, share your knowledge with others because many of our participants have amazing knowledge because they're educators or because uh, they've had other experiences that they can then share. So we have a wonderful learning community that is full of folks with all kinds of, of interesting uh, knowledge and perspectives that they, you can then share with each other. And Margo, I'm going to uh, to unshare my screen right now. So I am wondering if you can share the link, this link to the um, Naturalist Ed series in the chat so that if they want to go directly to the page, uh, people can can uh, click on that. Remember, I can't I can't swipe it. So, OK, then let me go ahead and unshare my screen. Read it to me. Okay. Um, well, actually, I, I I was just going to unshare my screen. I'll leave it. No, leave it there, and I'll, I'll put it in. Okay. Okay. 
So um, it is uh, HTTP. No, I can, I can read it. I'm good. Okay. Oh, you good can. Up. Sorry about that. Okay. It's in. Okay. Fantastic. So thank you all. Um, it's always... I always enjoy uh, getting a chance to <laughs> do exactly the opposite of what I just said and be a sage on the stage and tell everybody everything that I know. Um, but uh, uh, but I, I've enjoyed this intimate group and we definitely have time to now actually uh, verbally uh, ask questions and, and talk to each other. So if anyone wants to ask any questions or make any comments, please do. Hi, Ned. Oh, hi, Stan. Hi, hi guys. I see you all. Um, I was just wondering about uh, Margot's question about what causes the foam. And is that because of oils in the plant, like from, from leaves and things getting churned up in the water? Yes. So that's actually, so there, there are probably two different um, processes at work there. So, um, Ned, I know you're familiar with soap, with soap plant. Uh, so mm -hmm. there are a number of species at the preserve like soap plant that have saponins, naturally occurring saponins uh, that will foam up. Uh, and okay. then another source of foam is, um, let's see if I, if I get, I can remember the, um, uh, remember the, the acronym, but I can't remember the, um, Dissolved organic compounds, so DOCs, dissolved organic compounds, uh, and and like you said, that's just essentially coming from well, really anything that has carbon in it, <laughs> which okay. is just about anything that's alive. Mm -hmm. So the mixture of that can really make it make a really foamy, foamy uh, part of the creek. If I see just myself, if I see a lot of foam in part of the creek, I. I think that there's something with saponins upstream, mm -hmm. uh, but there's there's a little bit of foam in a lot of places because of those DOCs. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Are there um, any other, Julie? I was just curious, Suzanne, was that video the day after the atmospheric river and it does it still look a little bit like that or is it not at all like that anymore? That's a great question question. So it was the day after the atmospheric river and I zipped down there because it, it doesn't look like that at all. It, it really only flows like that for maybe tops two or three days after a big rain event, especially because we were coming out of our dry season and it was, um, uh, it, it was the first big storm after in the fall. I mean, you know, we, we all like the, the soil was all dry. I don't know if, if uh, those of you who've been on the Osborne preserve, if you saw all those big cracks, like there were big cracks. In yeah, this yeah, it was rough. And uh, so even though we got about 10 and a half inches of rain at the Osborne preserve, it was, um, you know, it, it like took a while for the soil to get all fluffy and, you know, absorb everything before the creek itself started flowing. So I knew that I had a limited time. So I just, I just went down there. Uh, that Was it right at the crossing, right at the crossing by the stream, by the trail? Actually, it was up by Stone Circle. Oh, okay. So, and, and since you've been there, Ned, you know that under you know most circumstances that's not flowing at all yeah yeah i don't associate even much water there being there mm -hmm. yeah 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 uh, but i will say that in a wet year so the last really wet year that we had which was a few years ago once you know like you get some big storms that'll flow then it'll then it'll kind of it's not flowing you get more big storms and it'll flow and if you get enough rain kind of over the course of a wet season it can flow almost consistently. So the last wet year that we had, the waterfall was flowing, geez, so, so often that I almost stopped going down to look at it, which was silly of me because then it stopped, then it just stopped forever, you know, until, until this next atmospheric river. Uh, so it can reach a point where it's flowing much more consistently, but in a regular kind of not huge, you know, wet season, then, then you've got about two or three days after a storm to go see it. 
Suzanne, that you hang on. Suzanne's willing to hang on a little bit more and chat with people about any of their questions or anything else, but I want to just kind of formally wrap us up. Um, thank you, Suzanne. I thought it was very, very interesting. I always learn so much when I hear you. I appreciate that. And thank you all for coming and supporting um, the efforts and work that, that we're doing here. Um, as I mentioned, this is just one of the events that we have, the virtual events that we're doing this year. We have six more remaining. And would you, Julie, put in the chat the um, calendar Absolutely. URL so that if anyone's interested in registering, seeing what the other events are. Um, our next one on November 10th is part of our Building Resilience series, and it brings together thought leaders from our campus and from the community to discuss local food systems and disasters and what action can be taken about those. Uh, and then we will be doing a Create Climate Sanctuary for Backyard Wildlife. And that is appropriate for adults and for children. And that's with Kevin Monroe, who is a regular expert uh, on this series. It'll be a hands-on local nature program to give you an overview and practical ideas for your own yards. Um, and we will have this recording will be uh, up on our website in the next couple of weeks, and I will send it, send the link to you all if you want to see it and then share it liberally with people that you think might be interested in the topic. So um, thank you all for coming, but please don't feel like this is a cutoff, go on and ask, continue more questions and see what Suzanne can, can teach us.